Hello ladies and gentlemen, I hope everyone is doing well today. Today we are taking a look at transition metals. So, um, so again, we're continuing our ionic bonds, just this time we are now including transition metals. So we have a little bit of information to start off. So what I highlighted is the important stuff. So transition metals are not easy to predict. If you remember, we can predict the charges of the elements that are in the S and the P block. Uh, however, we cannot do that for the transition metals. Remember, guys, uh, we can predict the charges for the S block right here. We can predict the charges for the P block right there. And then the transition metals, which are found in the D block, we cannot predict. Um, however, it is worth mentioning that there are three transition metals that are exception to this rule. There are three of them, silver, zinc, and cadmium. All of these have charges that are constant, have charges that don't change, so we can predict them. Um, it is worth mentioning that you should uh, maybe not memorize these, but you should have, uh, when you see these three elements, they should like trigger something. You will have a list of elements, uh, a list of polyatomic ions that you'll be able to use. These three transition metals will be included on it, but you still need to recognize that there's something funky going on with silver, zinc, or cadmium. You won't need to remember the charges, but you need to remember to look at your list for the charge. So down here we have um, a few, a few naming, a few formulas that we're gonna that we're gonna work on that use these transition metals. So the first one I'll do for you, and then you can do B and C. So we start with silver nitrate. So we start with silver. Silver is one of the three that don't change. So silver has a plus one charge. Next we have our. I gotta just grab it our polyatomic ion list from the previous chem class. We're looking up nitrate. Nitrate is NO3 with a minus one charge. And then we crisscross. So then the answer becomes AG NO3. So guys, um, next, do the next two B and C. Remember the difference between eight and I'd. Remember if it ends in eight, it's going to be one of our polyatomic ions. If it ends in I, it's going to be a negative ion found on the periodic table. Remember, all negative ions are found on this side. So next, next, the reason why transition metals are so hard to predict is because transition metals have more than one charge when they become an ion. For example, copper can be copper plus one or copper plus two. Again, iron. Iron can be iron plus two or iron plus three. So to figure out the, so when we use the transition metal, we use what it's bound to to figure out the charge. And remember, we can do this because all ionic compounds want to be neutral. So in question two, when we are going to figure out the charges of some of these transition metals, um, what we need to ask ourselves is what is the, what must the charge of the transition metal be to make the compound neutral? So if I struggled reading that word, you guys probably would too. So let me just quick fix this. It says must. So what must the charge of the transition metal be to make the compound neutral? So that's for example right here. We can I will do A and C, and then you will be able to make B and D after me. So we look at copper chloride. So remember, we need to use what the transition metal is bound to to figure out the charge of it. So we are going to use the charge of chlorine to figure out the charge of copper. So look over here. Chlorine is found in column 17. That means when it becomes an ion, it's going to gain one electron to look like argon. If it gains one electron, you're gaining something that's negative, so it's going to become negative. Because we are gaining one electron, it's going to become negative one. Then we need to remember to look at the subscripts. We have two of them. So, we need to multiply that negative 1 by 2, which gives us an overall negative 2 charge from the chlorine. What that tells us is copper must be plus 2 to make it neutral. So now you can do B do be very similar to how I did A. Just remember, what's going to change is the subscript. So how does that change the charge of copper? So then over here, I will do C, and then you can mimic D after C. 
So we have, we see that we have our transition metal, and then we have SO4. Hopefully, you remember SO4 is a polyatomic ion. So we come and look over here. It has a negative two charge. So what I don't want you to be confused on is don't be confused on this four that's a subscript. Remember, that four is a part of the sulfate ion. It's a part of SO4 right there. So we do not multiply by four because sulfate needs to have four oxygens. And that's what this tells us right here, that this is sulfate. So we know that sulfate has a negative two charge. So what that tells us is Fe must be positive two to balance it out. So guys, you can answer B and C. You can mimic it the way I did A and Sorry, you can do B and D, mimic it the way I do A and C. So then down here, question three. Question three, we are going to try to name the compounds from question two. So guys, it's important that you try to do this right now. Follow the same uh, rule, the naming rules that you uh, have followed in the previous chem class. So pause it now and try to name them the best you can. All right. So over here, um, so it is important that you named it first because now I'm going to give you the answers. So what you hopefully saw was that you got the same exact name for A and B. Um, what we include now is we include Roman numerals when we have transition metals. So hopefully what you found out, because uh, you did B and D, but I did A and C. So look, what we notice is that the, the Roman numeral that's inside the parentheses in the name tells us the charge. Because look, copper over here is a plus two charge. Iron over here is a plus two charge. And that's what the Roman numeral is. Double check. Did you calculate the charge is one in B and three in uh, D? So double check the charges in question two. If you did not get those as your charges, make sure you ask me for a little help. So when we come here to number four, we find that the Roman numeral equals the charge of the transition metal. So now question five. So why, why, is, why is it called manganese 4 oxide? So we know that the 4 is going to tell us the charge of the transition metal. So now you can do the math to, to prove it. Why is this a 4? Why does manganese have a plus 4 charge? Question 6. Question 6 is naming a few of these transition metal compounds. So we are going to follow for 6 and 7. We still follow the same ionic bonding rules. Now we just add Roman numerals if the compound contains a transition metal. Remember, the Roman numeral tells us the charge. So I'll help you with the first few, and then you can work on the rest. So we can start with part A. So we looked at it's nickel and NO3. So, sorry, we see it's Ni and NO3. So we know that we're using metals, so we can look up nickel. Nickel is right here. It is a transition metal. So that means we need to have Roman numeral in our answer. We cannot predict the charge. So remember, it is a metal, so it's positive. So we write nickel. We don't have to change the name. We need to figure out the charge, though. So we come over. Oops, that was the wrong one. We come over to the previous chem class because NO3 is a polyatomic ion. And look, NO3 is right here. It has a negative one charge. So then to balance it out, nickel must have a positive one charge. So we put a one in the Roman numeral. Oops. And then we add nitrate because that is the name of NO3. It is worth mentioning, guys, I just remembered that uh, we may need help with Roman numerals. So that is Roman numeral one. This is Roman numeral 2, Roman numeral 3, Roman numeral 4, and Roman numeral 5. I do not think we will have to go past 5. Um, but those are your Roman numerals, so you can use those inside the parentheses. <coughs> so next is 6b. So I'll help you with another one. So again, we find that CR, CR is in our transition metal, so we cannot predict the charge. We need to include Roman numeral in our answer. So we start with the name of CR. We look it up on the periodic table, and it's chromium. Next, we can figure out the, the Roman numeral, the charge of chromium. 
So, to do that, we look at CO3. <coughs> CO3 is a polyatomic ion. So we come over here and we look at our polyatomic ions. We see that carbonate has a minus 2 charge. So, we have our minus 2 charge. We notice that there are th three uh, carbonates. So we multiply by 3, which gives us a negative 6 charge. So I'm looking over here at chromium. What's chromium's charge? We need to figure out what times 2, because we have our Roman numeral of 2, equals positive 6. So uh, the answer is 3, because 3 times 2 is positive 6. So we would put a 3 inside our Roman numeral, and then we add the name carbonate. Uh, I will help you guys with one more um, 6C. So again, we start the same way. So we see Fe is iron. It's on our periodic table right here. It's a transition metal, so we can't predict the charge. So then we write the name iron. Now we need to figure out the charge. So we already figured out that in this one, that nitrate has a negative 1 charge. So that means nitrate is also going to have a negative 1 charge over here. So that means iron must have a positive 1 charge to balance out the negative 1 to make it 0. So we would write iron 1 nitrate inside of our parentheses. So guys, uh, continue to answer these questions D through H. Follow the same steps that I do. So next, next question 7, we're writing some formulas. So this time we use, remember when we write formulas, we use the crisscross method. It will also be helpful to remember that the Roman numeral is equal to the charge. So we can start off with mercury 2 acetate. So we need to just find the symbol for mercury on our periodic table. Mercury is Hg. It tells us that it has a positive 2 charge. And then we can look up the acetate ion. So acetate is C2H3O2 with a minus 1 charge. So let me write that. C2H3O2 with a minus 1. So now we do the crisscross method. So remember guys, sometimes you are going to need parentheses and sometimes you are not. This is an example when you would need a parenthesis because look, as I'm rewriting this final answer, C2H3O2, and then I have to add this 2 to the end. Look, if I add this 2 without parentheses, it looks like I have 22 oxygens. That's not the case. We want to have just two acetate ions. So we can do 7B. So we do it the same way. We need to look up the symbol for chromium. Uh, we find, when we look it up, we find that it's CR. The Roman numeral tells us it has a positive 3 charge. And then we have sulfate. So we look up sulfate on our list. SO4 with a minus 2 charge. And then we crisscross. So remember, when you're crisscrossing, ask yourself, will you need parentheses? So watch, when I'm writing SO4, now I'm going to add the 3 that's, that's over here. So I'm going to add this 3. If I don't have parentheses, it looks like I have 43 oxygens instead of 3 sulfates. So next, um, you can answer C, D, E, and F um, following the same steps that I use for A and B. So question 8. Question 8 is helping you remember the difference between 8 and Ide. Um, oh, sorry, not 8 and Ide. It's helping you the difference between Roman numerals. So remember, when you're thinking about Roman numerals, look at the metal. So which kind of metals need Roman numerals? And then lastly, guys, questions 9, 10, and 11, uh, we have already gone over. They are more naming and, uh, yeah, they're just more naming uh, problems. So make sure you follow the appropriate rules. When I quickly glance at it, I do notice that there are transition metals. There are no there are compounds with no transition metals. There are polyatomic ions, and there are also negative ions. 
So you are going to have to use the rules that you've learned from ionic bonding to up until uh, question 8 in transition metals. Like always, if you have any questions, please circle them, write down your question, and bring it to class. You will still get credit for it. And like always, I try to end these with a joke. So what's orange and similar to a parrot? Or sounds like a parrot? A carrot! I hope everyone has a wonderful day. I will see you next class. Bye.